Hello everyone, welcome to another video of Pulmonology Read Aloud. My name is Dr. Anshuma Neja Arora. I am practicing pulmonologist in Gurgaon and today I am coming with a new topic and a new article. And today's Read Aloud article is from the American Thoracic Society uh, IPF update. So these are clinical practice guidelines of the ATS, ERS, GRS and ALAT associations and this is an update to the 2018 document. Well the 2018 document was in itself a very landmark document because it actually started describing IPF more simplified manner into typical UIP, probable UIP, indeterminate and alternate diagnosis. So ever since 2018 guidelines came, the group is now coming up with an update. This was published in February 2022. There are few important things which are portrayed and which have been introduced in this. So we'll be briefly going and reading aloud what is in th is this guideline update. It also deals with the new terminology, progressive pulmonary fibrosis, and I will be covering that in the next follow-up video after this one. So let's get started. So basically there are two kind of recommendations given in this article. One is a strong recommendation which according to the group should work in most of your patients with suspected IPF and that's the right thing to do in most cases and you may just do it. Although every time remember that guidelines are only meant to guide you, they're not absolute and sometimes individualized management is the right key in not following the guidelines. But having said that, there are also certain recommendations which are conditional and in that sense you can actually choose whether your patient will benefit with it so you can slow down think about it discuss with the patient and not necessarily follow them but they have some evidence around them so has the IPF definition changed number one IPF still stays as a chronic fibrosing interstitial pneumonia of unknown idiopathic cause and it is associated with radiologic and histologic features of UIP. So usual interstitial pneumonia or UIP is the hallmark and what's important takeaway from this definition is that you must have a consistent radiologic and if possible a histologic association as well. Now this is taken from the 2018 document again presented again in this article and this really defines that once you suspect an IPF either you should have a good HRCT compatible pattern of UIP, probable UIP and if in case you have indeterminate pattern you should have a supporting histopathology if your histopathology speaks of uip or probable uip in presence of an hrct pattern you can make the diagnosis of ipf with quite certainty but if your histology pattern histopath pattern does not support a UIP or probable UIP then it's a non-IPF diagnosis and this is very important because uh, sometimes it has been seen that there may be a unexplained patterns of pulmonary fibrosis and uh, which may not be typical UIP in patients who are otherwise elderly who are presenting with similar clinical features and so diagnostic confidence may need to be downgraded if histopath assessment is not is supportive so basically we have to look at the totality and mdd or multidisciplinary discussion is a very important part of ipf diagnosis this is again something that was in 2018 a quick recap where ipf uh, diagnosis based on hrct was divided into a typical uip which is quite confident of ipf or a probable uip indeterminate or alternate which does not suggest a IPF and quickly the histopath and CT features in a typical UIP would show most predominantly honeycombing, tractional bronchiectasis on the CT, inter irregular thickening, interlobar septal thickening and less commonly GGOs or other superimposed findings but honeycombing is one hallmark and the distribution in the CT is usually subplural basal, heterogeneous 
and normal lung may still be present interspersed. What makes probable UIP different is there is no honeycomb being pressed, subplural basal predominance, heterogeneity, reticulation, and tractional bronchiectasis or bronchiectasis, which is common to both the groups, may be present here. They may also have some GGOs. If you don't find these patterns, you call it indeterminate. Which and this pattern would usually be usually be more diffuse. There may not be a subplural predominance, and here the CT features of lung fibrosis also may not point out to tractional dilatation. Sometimes um, this is more like a bucket um, a diagnosis where you don't find this. So anything else that you see here and which is not in the alternate diagnosis would probably fit into indeterminate. And the last one is alternate diagnosis where all your other diagnoses like uh, features of NSIP, features suggesting HP, nodules, perilymphatic distribution, uh, features of CTDILD, non-IPF CTDILDs, uh, or sorry, non-UIP CTDILDs, and uh, features of NSIP may be present. You may get cis, you may get GGOs, you may get nodules, consolidation, or and all the other features non-supportive of UIP. They've given a quick recap of the radiologic features of definite UIP. So as a quick reference, uh, if you find uh, tractional bronchiectasis, bronchiolectasis, which is which appears in this manner, you see irregular bronchial bronchiolar dilatation and this usually forms because of the retractile fibrosis in the surrounding which pulls them and um, you can identify this reticulation, this tractional dilatation which is a typical hallmark of definite UIP as well as probable UIP and also um, in contiguous HRCT, you know, if you trace this back towards more central bronchi, you may see a contiguity. So this pattern is the typical or usual interstitial pneumonia or probable UIP pattern. And what is a hallmark of UIP, as I said, is honeycombing. And honeycombing is nothing but bronchiolar cysts. And how do these cysts develop? after the collapse of the alveolar septae because they are fibrotic and the dilatation of the terminal airways. So there are connected, almost connected cysts and these include dilatation of the peripheral airways. And usually it's seen that tractional bronchiectasis and honeycombing may occur in continuum in, and this process may be a continuum. So what is seen just as tractional bronchiectasis today or probable UIP today may actually develop into a typical UIP. So again, uh, division of these two processes may be misleading, but then in future we may have a common definition for them. So how does honeycombing look like? A recap, honeycombing looks like these subplural predominant, lower lung dominant, uh, small cysts in clusters, thick walled, you can make out the walls easily. They have similar diameters. They may measure between 3 or 10 mm. Sometimes they may be huge. They may be 2.5 centimeters as well sometimes. And the size will increase. The numbers will increase as the disease progresses. It will go more caudal. And um, sometimes even a single layer of cyst may be seen. Still, it will be called as honeycombing. And this is very essential feature for a definite UIP. And this is what it correlates with. This is a honeycomb, uh, the bee honeycomb. And this is exactly how this would start looking like. So a typical hallmark of UIP. What's not honeycombing is more irregular cysts more large cysts of um, usually single layer. You don't see multiple layers one on top of the other. No tractional dilatation such as this paraseptal emphysema and another entity called airspace enlargement with fibrosis, basically emphysematous patient with unusual fibrosis. This terminology is used. Again here, there may be fibrosis and there will be asymmetric cysts. They are not uniform, they are clustered, they are larger, they are irregular and uh, may be seen in emphysematous patients. So this is not honeycombing and we need to differentiate. They've also talked about a term called pluriparenchymal fibroelastosis, PPFE, 
a not so common diagnosis they've mentioned it may be seen in 6 to 10 percent of ipf cases but why is it more relevant because these patients have a more rapid lung function decline they have a higher risk of pneumothorax they have pleural prognosis so here you will see pleural fibrosis or pleural thickening bilateral irregular along with reticulations so fibrosis and pleural thickening uh, in a patient with IPF may suggest PPFE as a coexistent diagnosis. So the diagnostic algorithm remains same but a lot of emphasis has been given to the point that if you see an HRCT pattern of UIP or probable UIP either cases you may just treat him as IPF and you may not need a surgical confirmation a biopsy confirmation if it's typically fitting into the picture even though it's probable UIP because remember tractional bronchiectasis may ultimately develop into honeycombing but if you see an alternate diagnosis or an indeterminate for UIP diagnosis on the HRCT but if the histopath speaks of probable UIP then again non-IPF categories can be considered and here you need a MDD and you need to further probably choose which path to follow. Now there's also mention about UIPs other than IPF and mostly three main entities have been described as common uh, for UIP non-IP one is HP so HP you may see a UIP pattern this is a normal scan and an expiratory scan which is very important in patients suspected with HP and you see the typical three density sign you can see almost three colors here the gray the black and the more whitish uh, this is because of air trapping this is because of uh, ground glassing this is because it's an expiratory scan and here you may have this three density sign the mosaic attenuation mostly upper and middle lobes of the lung may be involved there will be a tractional bronchiectasis as in this case and they may also be honeycombing so it fits into uip but the expiratory scan confirms it is a hp patient so hypersensitivity pneumonitis one cause of uip but non-ipf another common one being ctd ild with uh, very typical and very beautifully defined features in ct scan these include exuberant honeycombing exuberant honeycombing means you have lots of honeycombing in the ct sometimes occupying more than two-thirds of the image and you have a sharply demarcated line of fibrosis a sharp cut below which there will be honeycombing and fibrosis and above which it may be normal another sign is anterior lobar sign up anterior upper lobe sign where the four corners the anterior parts of the lung will show honeycombing and the lower parts will show honeycombing and they have extensive honeycombs even up to 70 percent maybe just honeycombing so very common with ctd ild ctd uip and also in drug induced sometimes with exposure related uips you can get a uip pattern in non-ipf such as occupational exposures Coming to the other concept of probable UIP now. So probable UIP has also received due attention in this paper and they have uh, given an emphasis to point that in future we may actually see a merger of UIP and probable UIP into one category and why is that so because they've observed that sometimes they have a similar disease course and behavior so it may not make sense to divide them like this and if you do a, a biopsy in a patient with UIPs many times they would just term it as probable UIP so again they may be a common occurrence and in an appropriate clinical context actually you may not need a histopath confirmation again to divide whether it's UIP and not probable UIP. But since they found that there are certain studies that report a difference in survival in UIP versus probable UIP and because they are still awaiting more expert setting studies and studies in general population and real life studies so they are 
actually still maintaining the differentiation and um, there may be some groups where probable UIP may be more uh, than the others so they are still retaining the term but future get ready to probably see them together. In terms of histopathology coming out of the radiology they mentioned that whenever you find a typical UIP it has to be patchy remember it's heterogeneous on the CT dense fibrosis with architectural distortion which is seen in the form of this honeycombing usually subplural basal paraseptal with foci of fibroblasts and then all the features that suggest alternate diagnosis like nodules like ggos like cis should be ruled out and then we can confirm that this is a uip on histopathology and if you see everything uh, except alternate diagnosis then and if you don't see honeycombing you can term it as probable uip now another important addition to this year's this statement guidelines is about transbronchial lung cryobiopsy so when in 2018 this paper was presented the evidence was not strong to support transbronchial lung cryobiopsy but what you will find with this paper is they have accepted transbronchial lung cryobiopsy as a good alternative to surgical lung biopsy to diagnose ILD. Now, a lot of talks that you may listen, it may come as uh, acceptance or a guideline recommendation to do a transbronchial lung cryobiopsy in patients of ILD, but that is not the case. You go a bit deeper into it and you understand that they have mentioned that it's a really challenging issue to consider transbronchial lung cryobiopsy uh, because sometimes uh, when you pick up a cryobiopsy report the the subplural predominance of the pathological changes here may not be considered so you may actually not be appreciating what is going on in the subplural region even though you have done a uh, cryo and so you may miss out certain diagnosis and have a false negative secondly there's a lot of potential for sampling error there is a lot of variability in the techniques there may be less confident diagnosis so that may be an issue here and if you compare with the surgical lung biopsy a lot of transbronchial lung cryobiopsies have demonstrated a more probable UIP pattern than a definite UIP pattern because sample size of the tissue obtained is smaller. With the surgical lung biopsy, we obtain a bigger tissue. So these are certain limitations and so it's not very easy to accept this. So what is the recommendation? You go through the recommendation and it is a conditional recommendation. So may suit to some of your patients, not all, that it may be regarded as an acceptable alternative to surgical lung biopsy to make a histopath diagnosis in patients with ILD of undetermined type but where in medical centers with an experience of not only performing but also interpreting the transbronchial lung cryobiopsy so that's very very important if the center doing cryobiopsy is not able to do it in a good way or interpret or the pathologist is not confident you may actually have an underdiagnosis so then in that case it may not be fruitful so the current recommendation asks whether patients with newly detected ILD undergo a TBLC to obtain samples and the answer is that the diagnostic yield is the critical outcome here if you have a good diagnostic yield if you're using a 1.9 to 2.4 mm cryo probe with fluoroscopic guidance if you use deep sedation mostly rigid bronchoscopy your yield is good and there's an 80 percent diagnostic yield of transbronchial lung cryo versus a 90 percent in surgical lung then it's a very good alternative but important is that the person doing this procedure should be capable enough expert the facility and the person interpreting the sample should be able to do justice so it may not be appropriate for all patients but it may be in some so it is a conditional recommendation another recommendation is about genomic classifier if you go back and look at the studies on ILD diagnosis or IPF diagnosis in 2020 around 2021 
you'll see a lot of studies on a genomic test or a genomic classifier test which aims to improve our ability to interpret ipf and distinguish from other ilds based on the transbronchial lung biopsy and its uh, further analysis based on rna sequencing and that ways we may pick up a uip so there are a lot of studies and there are certain uh, companies which are promoting a genomic classifier so the committee here says that they are not making any recommendation for a genomic classifier or against a genomic classifier for testing in uip it needs more data it needs a lot of more evidence because the sensitivity has to improve we have to look at what will happen if we have a false negative based on a genomic classifier it's not widely available so more and more data should be done till then there is no recommendation about it the last but not the least section on ipf is on treatment of ipf and the most important recommendation is regarding antacids so it was highly believed that uh, gastric reflux is one of the causes of IPF. So, antacid therapy was usually prescribed to most patients with IPF. But the committee, based on the latest evidence, recommends that you should not treat all patients with IPF with antacid medication just for improving their respiratory outcome. It is again a conditional recommendation, not a strong recommendation. It does not have a very good quality of evidence. So, only patients who have symptoms of GERD. If you have symptoms of GERD, then you may treat them with antacids. And if your patients do not have symptoms of GERD, then you need not. The con to this is that uh, since antacids do not have any statistical significant effect on whether it is the progression of the disease, whether it's on exacerbations, whether it's on symptoms, so you may not add antacid in every patient. And so antacid therapy will improve outcomes probably in patients who have good so if your patient has good known you may do that if your patient is not you may not add it and there are also certain anti-reflux surgeries that sometimes are done on patients in an attempt to reduce the uh, gastric reflux causing increase in ipf so that is not recommended again a conditional recommendation but for improving a respiratory outcome you would not like to do that uh, a very good uh, table or flow chart here is talking about diagnosis of ipf the consideration of treatments that are, we have as of now monitoring and and evaluation and this is a beautiful flow chart because it says that when we diagnose IPF what consider treatments we can consider uh, the pathway the schematic pathway would involve number one a consensus by discussion and treatment options should include both pharmacological which are two either nintadanib or profenadone and non-pharmacological measures which include oxygen supplementation and pulmonary rehab and simultaneously we should treat the comorbidities which may be pulmonary hypertension GERD OSA and lung cancer and now patients may also benefit from symptom control or palliative care once you've done that you need to monitor your patients for disease progression you you can consider pulmonary function testing and six minute walk test every four to six months or if you think your patient is worsening do a pulmonary function and uh, walk test earlier consider an annual hrct if you suspect that the patient may have worsened consider an hrct whenever you have a concern there's a worsening with an acute exacerbation and consider a ct pulmonary angiogram if you suspect pulmonary embolism for patients with acute exacerbations you may consider steroids and if patient has a respiratory failure due to progression of ipf you have to take a guided decision with the patient's family regarding further mechanical ventilation or long-term care evaluate this patient list him early for lung transplant and continue palliative care so this is really important and this is the timeline of the schematic pathway that you can follow so that's all for today the part two of this talk would be on ppf the new term entity in fibrotic ild other than ipf till then happy reading and bye bye